You know, I don't understand this podcasting thing. How come you boys can't have those keg parties and chase the girls like all the other nice boys do? Y'all are nerds. Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's the Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and on today's roundtable, our team will talk about retirement, as in, when's the right time to retire? Here to help us is the founder and president of Capital City Wealth Management, Benjamin Brandt. Plus, a woman who'd sometimes like to send us all to space. I'm talking like, pow, right to the moon. It's Paula Pant. And finally, the first person to walk on the moon, Buzz Aldrin. Wait, was that the other guy? Anyway, we couldn't get either one of them. We just got our resident space cadet, Len Penzo. But that's not all. Halfway through the show, I'll share my excessive trivia question. And now, a guy who traveled beyond the Earth's atmosphere just to get another passport stamp, it's Joe Salcihai. I, t- I think I do need to get the bigger passport book. But hey, everybody. Welcome to Friday. I'm so happy you're here. You know what? We're going to kind of reset retirement for you. We're going to hopefully help you build some rubrics around what the right time is to to retire, thinking about retirement, how you think about your thinking about retirement. Uh, It's going to be a great show. I can't wait. Let's start off. We're going to have our specialist guest go last, but let's start off with a woman who's holding the microphone in her hand. Where the hell are you, Paula Pant? I am at a WeWork, and so I don't have a microphone stand. I've, I've got this. <laughs> wait, wait a minute. Wait a minute. They still have WeWorks? They're supposed to be We Bankrupt, aren't they? <laughs> we we Broke. <laughs> uh, yeah, they still have We. I think they've gone into bankruptcy twice now. So I don't know why I keep paying them, but here I am. Like, are you in Anne Hathaway's office right now? Did, did you like rent her office out? Remember that scene from the movie? No. Oh, I never saw the movie. It's good. Obviously. It's a movie. Do you think I've seen it? Right. <laughs> Let's just back up. Movie. Paula. No. Although I will say we were we were we were, we were sharing something about Len's uh, latest. Uh, uh, b- b- by the way, Len Penzo is here. How are you, Mr. Penzo? Well, I'm a little disturbed because you know you remember if I told you a few weeks ago I got a, an email from my colon telling me I had issues, and then I got an email today from my prostate, and uh, apparently it says I, it's the size of a lemon. So I've, uh, I'm a little concerned about that. I guess I'm gonna have to go to the doctor. Wait, wait, wait what's the doctor gonna say? I don't know, but I, if my prostate's the size of a lemon, I better get it fixed, don't you think? Well, when life gives you lemons. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just trying you to find get, the dad joke in here. You, you, get, you get emails. Hold on, you yes. get you get emails from your organs. Yes, well, certain ones. Yep. So far, Mr. Colon and Mr. Prostate have checked in with me, so I don't know what's next. I'm Prior afraid. Prior to, to the development of the internet, how did they communicate through snail mail? <laughs> I don't. Know. I don't know, Paula. Is that a rhetorical question? I hope. I just, I mean, we just started. I have no idea where the hell this is going. Do your job. Do your job, I, Joe. I just tried to say hi, Len. That's all we tried to do. And, and I, don't, I don't even know. But but uh, uh, we were having a discussion, though, this last week. And Len was showing us uh, Squirrel Cam Gone Wild, which was Squirrel Cam at Night. Squirrel which is very exciting. After dark. Squirrel Cam After Dark. Squirrel Cam After Dark. And and we saw some new friends at the squirrel cam. I believe you have rats. Yes, I do. <laughs> and Doug, Doug, Doug's like he's shocked that there's rats at, at my house. I'm like, of course there's there's rats everywhere. He, Paula didn't flinch. Paula Paula just yeah, said, yeah, I was like, well, there's rats. I was like, this must yeah. be Len's way of telling us that he's moved to New York. Yeah, I was going to say, Paula <laughs> probably has three roommates that are rats, but Len, <laughs> Southern California. No, but then wait a minute. Then we then so we brought up Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, and I will I will. Say, Paula Pant was like, "Oh yeah, I've seen that." They're yes. Like, what the What the hell? Hey, well, you're forgetting. I have a pet turtle, so I am more likely to see media that contains turtles. And guess what, guys? The guy who thinks he's probably in the wrong place because he thought this might have been a money podcast. <laughs> 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 From from retirement begins today. Radio retirement starts today. Radio Ben Brands here. 
Squirrels are just rats with better PR, I'm convinced. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> totally, totally. That's exactly right. They're the same thing. That's right. The, 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 the rats, Ben, are the, are the dirty cousins that they don't let, let out until night. <laughs> they don't get invited to the reunion. That, I, I think that might be right. Now, you were in North Dakota. Beautiful, by the way, North Dakota. I've been bragging about coming to see you ever since we did. But uh, you guys have you guys you used to have huge rats in North Dakota. <laughs> Those are called coyotes. <laughs> of course, the the rats of the uh, of the wolf world of the dog world. I don't I don't know. But, that might but, be. But, but, but how's the podcast going, Mister Brandt? We haven't seen you in a while. How you been? The podcast is going great. Uh, we're having lots of fun every Monday morning. We talk retirement topics and lifestyle topics and. All kinds of fun stuff. We're, we're starting to get into some health elements uh, as well. So we're kind of anything, anything retirement uh, I'm interested in. Well, health is a big, big topic. I mean, I know that uh, you can't, what's money if you're not healthy enough to enjoy it? Yeah, that's exactly right. I actually just last week had a full body MRI and I can tell you that my prostate is significantly smaller than a lemon. <laughs> That's why you didn't get an email from your prostate like I did. That's right. Yeah. How would they send that? that Would that be on on an MRI phone? Is that is that a bad joke? (laughs) Oh my god! Could you call that a Mister iPhone? MRI phone. Sorry. Sorry. (laughs) Oh my goodness. I think we should just wrap up right now and call it a day, Joe. <laughs> and that's our Friday. Thank you, everybody. You thought we were going to talk retirement. We're retiring today's podcast. It's over. Actually, you know what? We are going to get to retirement right now. But thank you for helping us keep this podcast free as we say hello to the people that make this free. I should have put that the Lampenzo way, where Len says, click on all my ads at least three times when you visit Lampenzo.com. Please don't skip through our ad. Should I have said that, Len? Now you're now you're learning, Joe. Now you're learning. Let let the let the money start flowing in. In fact, people should rewind and re-listen to the ads. <laughs> Great idea. <laughs> all right, Someone should got... write an algorithm where it just goes on loop. <laughs> just just play session. them all day. Please yeah. God do it. We got Ben Brand here. We got Len Penzo, Paula Pan, neighbor Doug. Let's talk retirement. Our piece today comes to us from uh, the people at New Retirement. Uh, Love their calculator. We actually have a great page about new retirement calculator on our YouTube page. So if you want to check it out, however, this is a wonderful blog post about retirement. Kathleen Coxwell wrote it and it's 10 reasons why you should actually retire at 62 if you can. And I'm going to go, I'm going to go to you first, Ben, because you know, it's funny. Uh, uh, Cheryl, my spouse, works in the medical field. She loves what she does. Um, And frankly, if she wanted to stop doing it today, she could. But she's like, I think I want to do it for another seven or eight years. Like, that would be great. And that, by the way, would put her around this age 62 they're talking about. I'm a guy who says, what would I do if I didn't get to talk to interesting people about weird topics like we had in the open? What would I be doing besides this? Yet this piece that I should really seriously think about retiring at 62 when you when you think about people doing something and they tell you they want to do it forever what do you think as a financial planner i say more power to you yeah i'm a i talk retirement topics for a living i don't see myself ever retiring I, what would i do with myself i i love what i do and it's enriching and if that is your job right if, if you're getting fulfilled by your job there's no reason to quit that people retire to go find that thing that's going to get them out of bed in the morning excited if you already have that and it's providing income for you that you should keep working i think paula what about what about you because you you know you and i have very congruent things that we're working on uh right. do you see yourself retiring you got a retirement date in mind no not at all i i hope you know my uh role model is betty white who at the age of 99 was still working and uh, out of choice and clearly loved it. You could tell just by watching her that she was having fun. Charlie Munger, same thing. He worked until he was 99 and you could tell he was enjoying every moment of it. So my hope is to be in good enough health 
that I'm able to work until I'm 99 or 199 or 1,099. You know, see how life expectancies go. Does that include, though, Paula, changes to your schedule? And the reason I ask that is... Uh, 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 you may know, you and I, are, I always call it the Westwood One Network. It's now the Cumulus Network. We are on there together. Uh, mm-hmm. But Ed Milet, another podcaster, uh, an influencer, just joined uh, uh, the Cumulus family of shows. But I was talking to somebody yesterday who said that Ed Milet travels 300 days a year. Mm. I can imagine Ed Milet continuing to do what he does. He seems to be another guy who's in a, I do this as long as I want to kind of mode. But, but do you see yourself changing your schedule, changing maybe the things that you do? Cause I can't imagine Ed Milet at 90 years old traveling 300 days a year. Well, even now, right. Even, even these days I change up my schedule based on what else is going on in my life. Um, you know, even now I, uh, just on a day by day basis, I will modify my schedule based on if I'm going to have like a, a big, like two hour workout in the morning or not. Right. Uh, that's just on a day to day basis. And like in the overarching sense, uh, if I, if there's a conference that I really want to go to, or, or if there's a trip I really want to take, I just went to Mongolia and China and Egypt, you know, and I was like, Hey everybody. I'm just not going to show up to work for like two and a half weeks. Peace out. No, this is you this know? is super cool, guys. So Paula goes to Cairo instead of making a podcast recording for Stacking Benjamins. Oh, <laughs> to, to, to be fair, I thought I thought it was when I thought that the recording was going to be on Wednesday. <laughs> oh, it, the recording was on Wednesday in Mongolia time. I just got my time zones confused. <laughs> uh, Doug's on Mongolia time, aren't you, Doug? <laughs> when it's convenient for me, yeah, like it was for Paula. <laughs> we had we had some fun at Paula's expense. It was it was a great time. But anyway, yes, but that's cool. But, but, but very seriously, you spent a day and a half in Cairo at the last minute. Yeah. So what happened was uh, I had a flight back that had a 19 hour layover in Cairo. And so I was like, OK, this is cool. 19 hours. That's enough time to like leave the airport and, you know, go do a, a little bit, you know, have a meal. And then I got an email from the airline uh, saying, hey, we've actually canceled the uh, Cairo to JFK portion of your flight, and we've rebooked you on another flight that is 24 hours later, which meant that I ended up having a 44-hour layover. So totally spontaneously with, uh, you know, without intending to. I had a a spontaneous two days in Egypt, which was great. But the fact that, yeah, I have a job uh, or I run a business, I run my own business, and that gives me the flexibility to just spontaneously spend two days in Egypt. And as a result, completely missed the Stacking Benjamins recording, (laughs) which I (laughs) thought was on Wednesday because it was on Wednesday in Mongolia time. (laughs) <laughs> it's it's fabulous. And actually, it, it was better that we got to record that at a different time. Len, Len, you were obviously on a different train, right? You were on a train of of I am going to retire from working for, quote, the man. When did when did you decide that r- retiring early was going to fit your lifestyle? Because you did retire early, even earlier than the 62 they put down here on this piece. Um, well, when I realized I had enough cash on hand, um based on my calculations, which are were conservative, to probably outlive myself. So that's – I got to that point and I said, hey, well, well then why not? Um, oh, was that you your know, goal at 30? At 30 was no, your goal to retire early? No, it no, was not. no, that was not my goal, no. Um, but, uh, you know, over time you, you have a career and if it's not a fun – you know, if it, I mean it's fun. I enjoyed my job immensely. But you know what? It does get tiring working for the man. It really does. It's like being – it's kind of like being in the military. I mean you have to answer to other people. You have – you have to get up at certain times. You have to go places where you might not want to go. You don't have the freedom that somebody who works for themselves does or um, who is already retired. So that gets old. It's not so much the job that you're working, but it's just the fact that you're, you're not, you don't have every, all your hours to yourself. You don't write your own life script. And it gets, as you get older, you want, to, you want that to, to be, uh, be able to do what you want when you want. And so that's how it is now. And I don't look at it as retired. I mean, retirement is just, I mean, what is, what is retirement? I mean, I'm retired from that, my job working for the man, but I don't consider myself retired. I mean, I have a lot of, 
irons in the fire. I'm doing lots of things. I have projects. I have hobbies. Um, and I'm enjoying life. And um, I'm very busy. So I, you know, we use the word retirement and we might think, well, we, you know, we sit back in the couch and we watch TV all day. Or squirrel camp. No, yeah, he's undertaken a longitudinal <laughs> rodent uh, study. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> exactly right, Doug. That, that's that's precisely. Now, and I want to go back real quick to Paula. I mean, she's the world traveler. That's great. She's going everywhere. I do, you know, I like to travel too, but I do it. Speaking of being a couch potato, in this case, I do by watching The Amazing Race. So I get to go to Cairo and all these places and see these places. I don't have to leave my living room. So that's how I prefer <laughs> to see the world in that regard. That way it doesn't interfere with my hobbies and all my other things that I'm doing. So, Do you see yourself, Len, going to Cairo? I mean, you're being <laughs> – No, I don't. I'm not sure if you're being <laughs> facetious. I, no, I'm not being – I don't for – I'm not a – you know, the, there are people who love to travel, and I'm – I don't like to. I'm a homebody, really. You know, I prefer staying local uh, or, if anything, staying within North America. Um, I think I've been to four countries my entire life, you know, and they're, they're all attached to the United States, right? I've been to – I've been to Canada and Mexico and the Bahamas and <laughs> – Sacramento and, and doesn't that's count. It. <laughs> and so that's it. That's my life. But I'm fine with that. I mean, that's that's you know, if if I do want to go, you know, I I just don't like to travel. Like I don't like everybody's traveling. doing the math on four countries that are attached. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. I was completely. <laughs> that's exactly what I was thinking. <laughs> like, Len, have you seen a map lately? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, public school education. <laughs> right there, proud product. <laughs> Ben, I wanted to I wanted to start there specifically because of how wide ranging this is. You know, we talked about Paula with spontaneity, uh, Len with working for somebody else and how that grinds on you. But when you I want to kind of set a rubric for people that are just beginning to have this discussion about retirement. And the reason I do and the reason I wanted to cover this was. I was at this coaching organization, strategic coach that I go to yesterday and a guy who I was sitting uh, close to. Between last quarter and this quarter, last quarter, he was gung ho about running his business. He was an entrepreneur. I mean, he's an entrepreneur. He runs a very successful business. Three, three months ago, he was gung ho about it. And then today he, he said, I think I want to figure out how to sell this. And I want to sell it like in the next three months. Like it changed. It changed fast, Ben. I mean, so it went from, I want to do this forever to, you know, I think I'm done. I'm, I'm, I'm just done. So, so where do we start along this retire when you're starting a people on retirement planning and retirement starts today, right? Where do we begin that rubric? Uh, that's a great question. When you mentioned strategic coach, you know, one of the uh, quotes that I heard from Dan Sullivan years ago that always stuck with me is that his definition of retirement is to be put out of service. And that always really stuck with me. And when we think about retirement or financial independence, it might go from my career to being where I'm in service to others to being in service to others in a different capacity. So maybe I'm in service to my local community. I'm mentoring. I'm helping my kids with their kids. I'm doing something else. But if, if, if retirement is to be put out of service, then working is to be in service to others. Maybe that changes. So that's, I think, a good place to start from a non-financial perspective is how am I going to still be of service to others, assuming that's where we get some fulfillment from? Is it then, I mean, taking this guy as an example that he went from never wanting to retire to let's sell it now. I think about when we rebound the portfolio, right? Uh, people are like, where the hell is this going? Because he said nothing to do with each other. But I think they do. It used to be several years ago, but he said, you know, once a year or twice a year, rebalance your investments to get back to your original asset allocation. And now most financial planners will tell you they don't like to do that. They like a band, right? A range. And, and, and when, when I hit a low or hit a high, that's when things change. Clearly, this gentleman came into this discussion where he was at the low end of that range and he'd had enough. So because of that reason, for you as a guy helping people plan retirement, should my goal with my assets be, if, if I'm a Paula Pant or a Joe Saul Seahigh, well, you feel that way now, but your, your feelings might change quickly. So this is a race to get your money where it should be as quickly as possible. Is it a, is it a uh, quicker is better kind of thing? Possibly. With your friend's situation, I would be concerned if, he, if he's been an entrepreneur his whole life and he's just going to you know, pack it up and sell it in three months, I would want a really well thought out plan on what he's going to retire to. Because uh, if you've been an entrepreneur your whole life in service to others, then you just quit. Um, an entrepreneur is, is, uh, has a lot of gravity in their life of always 
solving problems and putting out fires in a positive way. If you just retire and sell your business, uh, life will create its own gravity in a negative way. Uh, I know, I think we all know people that retire and then their health goes downhill or their relationships go downhill or they will create negative gravity. So if you're used to walking up hills your whole life, metaphorically, uh, you should probably just keep doing that your whole life. So I would be a little bit concerned. I want to know exactly what he's retiring to, how he's going to fill 40 hours a week, 50 weeks a year, whatever that is. That, that's where my mind goes. I think if it's those who want to retire earlier, I think you're adding your one thing you are doing is you're bringing more risk into your um, into your retirement plan because of the unknown unknowns down the road. You, you just have a longer lifespan if you retire early where more things can go poorly and things that something you might not have foreseen that could short circuit what you thought you had enough money for. Uh, and then you don't. So I, I think there's a there's definitely a risk of retiring earlier as opposed to someone like myself who retired relatively late or somebody who retires. At, you know, I retired at 58. Somebody who retires at, at 65 or 70. You know, the advantage of retiring later in that regard is there's if you've planned properly, there's less unknowns, unknowns out there that could really disrupt your retirement planning. So. First of all, Len, the only person who the only people that would say you retired late would be in the fire community, right? Any other community on earth, you retired early, my friend. You retired very, very early. Yes, I did retire. I, I retired relatively early. But I mean, what about the, there are people out there who are trying to retire at 40 or at 35 or at 42. I mean, that to me is that's really putting yourself out there. Well, so. I was actually talking, Len, about the inverse of that, which is you want Paula wants to work forever. And then three months from now, her feelings change. She's like, yeah, I think I want to sell for it anything. Like, I just, I just, I just don't want to do this anymore. You heard it here first, folks. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is how rumors get started right yeah. here. We'll do some creative <laughs> editing on that video. <laughs> Paula, just say yes. I was just thinking that if you could just speak right in the mic. I'm sure you can get an AI bot to do it and it would That's be even true. more believable. Good point. Paula Pant, deep fake. <laughs> we, uh, uh, but what I'm talking about is that, Len, not about retiring early, but about somebody that thinks that they're going to do it forever. And then all of a sudden that they don't. I mean, we should all be prepared for that. Yeah, I'll, uh, you should be prepared for that. I, but boy, that's I mean, I mean, what would cause somebody to do that? I, I don't know. Uh, somebody would just give up that quickly or, or want to get it unless you've totally I can tell you. I can tell you specifically what it is without outing the guy. Okay. He had some he had some surgery on 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 uh, on a thing that that was cancer. Um, and all of a sudden when he got this medical diagnosis. It made him aware that money wasn't the problem. Money hadn't been the problem for this guy for a long time. It was now time. And he finally took seriously the idea of, is this what I want to be spending my time on? So to Ben's point, what are you going to go to? I love the idea of pumping the brakes there, but, but, but so it was a medical thing, Len. I get it. And the older I get, I mean, the older we all get, I mean, you do see, you do realize time is the actual, you know, money can always be made. Time cannot. And uh, time becomes more precious as you get older. Uh, you know, you, you're, you do see your mortality uh, as you get older, you actually see it. And uh, it, it does change your reflections on things and it puts what's important. Uh, it brings it, the real importance of time really does trump money in the long run. It really does. Yeah. And I do think that, you know, like I, I mean, time where you're good and healthy, like as an example, I have this friend that kind of has a medical condition where he thinks that his organs write emails to him. <laughs> and I worry about the guy. I just, I, I do. He doesn't see it as a problem. You know, my cousin, that, but... my cousin, Kevin, always talks about um, uh, the CPA. He, you know, he's doing planning and with certain people. And, and he's always told people, he said, you know, people say, think the golden years are, are your 70s. And yeah, yeah, I'm in my golden years. You know, it's my 70s and my 80s. No, your golden years, he says, are really it's it's your 50s and your 60s. Those are your golden years. So, mm -hmm. I mean, if you're going to want to retire and enjoy life and, and get around and do things, you really should be planning to do all that before you turn 70, because after that, you know, physical ailments start popping up and you can't, you know, you, you have to be prepared that you might have saved all this money and you're not going to be able to do the things you want to do because now the, the physical ailments just prevent you from doing that. Paula, this piece is about retire early to do what Len talked about, but, but, but retirement or if you can swing at sabbaticals. 
Yeah, you know, so I, there are two concepts that I want to bring up right now. One is that I want to make sure that we're not conflating financial independence with retiring early. So mm -hmm. whether or not your goal is to retire early, I think everyone should have the option to retire early, whether or not you want to. And again, going back to Betty White or Charlie Munger, uh, they both had the option to do so. Now, Joe, to your point. Yeah, hold on for a second, Paula. So what you're saying is, when I asked Ben, is it a race to get your assets in order as fast as as you can, because things may change, your answer then would be yes. Yeah, yeah. I, th I think that uh, to the extent that, you know, you, you, you don't want to sacrifice today for the sake of tomorrow, right? You want to enjoy today while also building for tomorrow. So when the pendulum swings too far in the wrong direction, you can sometimes fall prey to the temptation to... Uh, live in the future rather than live merely for plan for it. Mm -hmm. Right. So the verbiage, is it a race? I mean, you know, you don't want to run so fast that you get injured. Right. So I would be a little bit careful with the race analogy just sure. because, you know, you, you, you want to still be living in today, but I do think that it's important. Again, Betty White, Charlie Munger, like Taylor Swift is financially independent. You know, she, if she wanted to retire, she could do so. She's not producing albums for the sake of paying the bills, right? She's doing it for the love of the work. She's not on the Eras tour uh, for the sake of paying the bills. She's doing it for the love of the work, right? I'm and sorry, so, I'm just laughing, Paula, just thinking about if she was doing it. She's like, do you know how about how high my credit card bill is? Like, seriously, I got to pack this thing. <laughs> yeah. I seriously had a bad month early last year. I ran up the Capital One card. I think we got to fill a tour. <laughs> Maybe not. And so regardless of whether or not you want to retire, I think everyone should be prepared to do so, even if you never actually act on that preparation. Uh, that's the first thing. The second thing, Joe, to your question, when you asked about sabbaticals, sabbaticals are wonderful. Um, I think that rather than defer traveling and defer pursuing hobbies, like rather than defer all of that into your 50s and 60s, do it throughout your life. You do it in your 20s, do it in your 30s, do it in your 40s, right? Like, because world travel is going to be different at different stages of your life. Your experience of traveling to another country or your experience of pursuing a hobby at the age of 28 is going to be very different than what that experience is like at the age of 38, at the age of 48, at the age of 58, at the age of 68, partially because the world changes and then partially because you yourself change. Like one of my emblematic stories about this, are, I went to Japan twice. The first time I went, I was 18 years old. The second time I went, I was 36. The first time I went at, at the age of 18, I was really excited about the fact that you could buy alcohol from a vending machine. <laughs> right. Uh, and they didn't. I'm excited ID. about that at 56. <laughs> but when I went back at the age of 36, I was really excited. You could buy coffee from a vending machine. <laughs> right. <laughs> so your experience of a place is going to differ depending on you know, where you are at that stage of your life. And it's nice to be able to to check back in with the same places, you know, go to go to Japan at 18 and at 36 and at 72, right? And see how it has changed and also how you have changed. Sometimes that's not possible though. Like if you have kids and a family, it's like you just can't travel in your 30s or your 40s. Oh, that's not true at all. That is not that is, true at all. That is true. No, that is, true. That is absolutely yes. not. Yes. No, unless that is not. That is, that is false. Paula. Fake news. Fake news. I have six kids and I never leave my house. Well, that's because you don't make it a priority. You do not make it a priority. You know how many people online have families and their kids are the reason that they travel. My kids are the reason I travel, but I leave them at home. <laughs> the first time that I ever took an overseas flight, I was six weeks old. All right. My family traveled all the time. We went to Thailand. We went to Nepal. We went all across Asia when I was a baby and when I was a young child. All right. Like. And if you go online right now, it has never been easier than ever. Like there are blogs, there are podcasts, there are forums. It, you are making excuses if you blame your kids for Paula, your I'm sedentary. Not no, it's kids. true. 
No, Paul. No, I'm, I'm, you no, are. No, 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 you're, hold you're on. also promoting a false <laughs> mythology. It is absolutely 100% false. And all you have to do is look at all of the travel bloggers, all of the travel podcasters. There are literally thousands of people on the internet who have families and who live on sailboats. They live in RVs. They travel the world. They've been to 100 countries. They've road school with their kids, right? Look at the entire well, road schooling community. Paula, that's not that's not how everybody can do that, Paula. I'm sorry. You can, you you, can everyone can. You People can, choose not no. to. But cut with this can stuff. Like everyone can, unless you have some type of a debilitating illness. There might be a health. So reason, money doesn't come into play, reason, Paula. Yeah. Paula, do you know how much you can, kids you can cost? Make, you can Paula, make money. No, you don't. You can, there are a million ways do. to make money. D cut with this can't bullshit. All right. Paula. Like my parents were immigrants. My parents had no money and they still took. Oh, stop. Would you stop? I just what? made a, an innocent comment. And now here you are talking about immigrant families. And well, come on. Yeah. Immigrants Let's, travel. 100 percent. Immigrants travel. 100 percent. Immigrants travel. Yeah. Most Not immigrants travel back to their home country. Up, immigrants. My life. Immigrants travel back to the Honduras. They travel back to Mexico. They travel back to Guatemala. They go see their families because it's a priority because it's important. And they take their kids with them. OK, very good. Then you heard it here, folks. Everybody can travel if they want to. Yes. Unless there's a medical reason. Yes. Unless there's a medical reason. OK, everybody there you can go. do it. There you go. I mean, daddy, please stop fighting. <laughs> I think that the use of the word can is the difficulty. This is where it becomes hard. It becomes hard with the thing that you love to do involves a career where you've decided. I think the thing here is, is in what you decided to do. You've decided the thing that you love is a career that will not sustain a sabbatical. It won't sustain a sabbatical. And, it, and I agree with you, Paula, that you made that decision, that that is your, that your priority, that, that, that you did that. But there also is, I think, Len, to your point, I think there is then the pull of, I got this thing that I love. Like we heard that the last time we talked about this a couple of years ago, we got this wonderful letter from a woman who's a nurse. She loves taking care of people. That is her Emma. It, it, it isn't even her vocation, her career. It is her identity. That is, that is how she sees herself as somebody that takes care of, of, of other people. The issue, the issue for her was, was that she's like, you make it sound like taking sabbaticals, like the world's easiest thing, like everybody can do it. And the answer is, Paula, to your point, everybody can do it. You can do it. But then there's that there's that discussion. I'd love to go to you, Paula, on this one, which is you've got this discussion between. I'm able to do it, but it's the thing I effing love to do. So where do I draw that line? So if the career allows for a sabbatical, then you return to that career after the sabbatical is over. So for example, if the career allows for uh, six months off, right? Or eight months off um, or three months off even. My question is the opposite. What is it? In, in this woman's case, she says that it doesn't. It, it doesn't. does not. All right. Oh, so are... Then is she able to do that career in a different location? She could. She'd take a massive pay cut. Okay. That was her problem. She's like, you guys made it sound like, and we did on that particular mm -hmm. roundtable. We all, me included, made made taking a sabbatical very easy. I didn't know. By the way, I didn't know sabbatical was going to be this hot button. But we did make it sound very easy. I remember on mm -hmm. that particular roundtable, and and she brought up, I think, Len, what you're trying to articulate was that yes, you can, but the huge sacrifice was going to influence her financial independence. It would influence the thing that she sees as her vocation. She likes the people that she's with. She totally can, but to, but to keep the quality of life she wants, while well, can't is a strong word and I get where you're coming from. See if she can negotiate with her employer for unpaid leave. If she could take three months of unpaid leave. And if that is, if the employer really won't allow that, then I would uh, ask to be either, either ask to be transferred to an alternate location temporarily, or I don't know how much vacation time she has, but if she can stack vacation time so she can roll vacation, let's say she's get, she gets four weeks a year, right? Four weeks in December, four weeks in January, that's two months, right? Two continuous months. So boom, now she's got two months that you can do a pretty big trip in two months. 
Yeah, I didn't want to put words in your mouth. Was that what you were trying to say? Yes, that's what I was trying to say. There's just uh, all I was trying to say is there are people that can't that I'm sorry, they can't do it because of they have other things that are happening that just it just isn't possible. There's other things going on in the family life that won't let you do it. That's all I'm trying to say. That's all I was trying to say. But I do think it's about priorities. It is prior. Yes, it is. Yeah, it's priorities. Yeah. Absolutely. You can do whatever you want. Of course, it's, you know, everybody has free will. But does it make sense financially for a lot of people? It's impossible. You can't do it, especially when you have kids. It's a huge expense. That's all I'm saying. And I had made a he heck of an income my whole career. And even at my level, I couldn't I couldn't justify it. I couldn't justify it. Could I have done it? Sure. Would I have retired at 58? No. But that's my choice. And, and I'm making a lot of money. And, and I know people that made, you know, most people made far less than what I made in my career as a salary. I cannot see how they could possibly have done it and still made ends meet. I'm going to bring Ben back into this for a second. Frankly, I don't think I see the idea of a sabbatical enough in, at least in American society. I can only think of one client that I've helped retire over the last decade or so that had a sabbatical. I think for a lot of people, it's just not something that's in their lexicon. But I think if you if you try to think about what a sabbatical, what we're trying to discover about ourselves with a sabbatical, could we recreate that under less grand terms? I think there's something like $50 billion a year in the United States that is squandered as unused vacation pay. So so while you know a six-month sabbatical would be great, what, what could we create in 10 days, you know, with, with unused vacation pay, what little pieces of data could we discover about ourselves and what we might want to pursue in retirement in smaller pieces? I think that is maybe more in reach for like an electrician or, or a school teacher or something like that. You know, it's funny. We, uh, we obviously hit an emotional hot button here, but I also think that, that there's two pieces to this retirement game, Ben, there's the emotional piece and there is the mathematical piece. Which, which piece do you see we get, to, we, we get wrong more? By far, people get the emotional part wrong, especially people who listen to retirement podcasts. They tend to be the numbers people. And so there's a saying that says, sell people what they want, give them what they need. So if, if somebody comes to me for the financial, obviously I do that, but then I give them the lifestyle and the mindset stuff. If somebody were to find me for the mindset stuff, we'd give them the financial stuff. So it's both, but especially in our kind of lexicon of, of financial topics, People tend to over-focus on big round numbers, whether that's taxes or having a million dollars, and they think a lot less about what am I actually going to do with myself for the next 30 years. I want to talk about things like health insurance, debt, right? The idea of, of, of debt in retirement and also the idea of Social Security. So benefits and debt and, um, and, and our health. We'll be back with that in just a moment, but please... As Len Penzo says, uh, uh, please uh, listen to these ads four or five times. Because of our travel schedules, uh, normal Stacky Benjamins Friday listeners are wondering what's going on with our trivia competition. No trivia today, kids. We are back on it. So we are going to dive back into the piece. Let's let's start here with with health insurance, Paula, health insurance and, and early retirement. Not two things that tend to go together. What do you think? Yeah, health insurance is um it's a very it it's an expensive line item when it comes to budgeting, right? Like we're used to paying a lot of money for housing. We're used to paying a lot of money for groceries. We're used to paying a lot of money for transportation. Those tend to be the three big uh, three big ticket items. Health insurance for people who are accustomed to being a W2 employee, um many people aren't used to spending a lot of money on health insurance. And so the mental flip is to understand that a huge proportion of your income or a much bigger proportion of your income is going to go towards health insurance. And what that means is that you have to claw back some of the money that you otherwise would spend on things like housing or transportation in order to make space for that. Well, you're also suggesting that I would think start getting price quotes way, way, way early and model it ahead of time. Yeah, well, you can go uh, with the with healthcare.gov. You can go on healthcare.gov and uh, and get that information, or you can go to a site like Policy Genius, um, and you can get that information. So there's a, a lot of different ways to gather it. Yeah, but you do agree with modeling it early. I mean, because like you said, yeah. you got to change your your you got to change your viewpoint. You got to go. You know what? Mm -hmm. This is naturally expensive, and you're very lucky that it's not. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, uh, Len, for you, how much was having, I'm, I'm assuming that you had employer provided healthcare. Yes, still do. Yeah. And so how much was that able to help you retire early? Uh, a lot, 25, 30,000 a year I'm saving just by, because I have such fantastic health insurance for my employer. If, if I didn't have that and I had to go out and just have health insurance, uh, myself, I think, I think the minimum right now would be two, 2,500 a month. So I mean that's a that's a significant amount of money. Huge. So that, that, that's huge. And and that if if I didn't have that, uh, yeah, I'd probably still be working. Well, would you be because you would have known that earlier? And this is what I was trying to get at when I asked asked Paul about this question was, you would have known that earlier. Do you think you would have made s- some sacrifices earlier and saved more money so that you could get this earlier date to re- to to exit? I knew what the details of the pension was and and, and the health benefits. I mean, from an early age when I first started working, you know, with the company. So um, if, boy, I don't know, I don't think I would just because I don't think I would have anticipated how expensive healthcare had gotten, you know, 30 years ago, I think it was, it was a lot cheaper. Sure. So, and now it's, it's just huge. So I, I don't think I would have, I think I just got lucky in that regard, uh, you know, cause I, I was just in a, in a business that had a pension that paid most of my health care for me. So I got lucky in that regard. But I do feel like, Ben, that, you know, when it comes to this idea of of retiring from whatever job that we're leaving, that we we set this date in our mind. We set this thing that we want to do. And then we kind of carve the numbers up to try to make that happen. Do you see a different do you see a big difference between people that have health insurance and the average age they retire? I would love somebody must have done some research on this. The average age they retire versus people that have to go out into the marketplace or wait for Medicare and do it on their own. Anecdotally, definitely. I mean, people that have health insurance paid have one last big budget item to think about. I mean, we're talking. But you see them retire earlier or or the other way. I see people that are on the hook for their own health insurance having the conversation that I'm, I'm, I'm going to work longer because I need to be their comfort level to be closer to 65. They want to be closer proximity to 65 because they're facing a thousand, you know, 1500, 2,500 a month, uh, for, for their health insurance. Some people can do the, uh, healthcare.gov and do an, an income based premium. But if you have a pension or if you have, you know, if your lifestyle, which you're taking out of your investments, you know, if you're more than six times the poverty level, you're not going to get a lot of of premium credit. So anecdotally, yeah, people that uh, people that have access to health insurance through their employer tend to retire sooner. People that are on their own tend to work longer in my in my experience. One of the one of the the, the 10 reasons it says to retire at 62, Paula, is retire if you're debt free or almost. And it says this this piece says probably the biggest indicator it's really okay to retire early is your debts are paid off or you're very close to it. But we've seen mortgages at some low, low rates. You and I did an afford anything episode talking about how there was somebody that called into your show who who was making more in their money market than yeah. they were, than they were it, paying out it, it, for their it mortgage. It wasn't even a money market. It was a savings account. Right. It was a, their high yield yeah, savings it was, account. It was a high yield savings account. And they were making more on their high yield savings account than their, their mortgage interest rate. So, so it retire early makes a if you're lot debt of free. Sense. But, but, you but, know what? but debt and retirement, let's talk about that. I, it makes a lot of sense uh, to hold on to a very, very low interest uh, mortgage, particularly if you can invest your money conservatively and arbitrage that. The Social Security game, Len, when you decided to retire early, how did you rectify that with Social Security? Well, obviously, I, mean, I was before, way before I could get Social Security. But whenever sure. I did my my retirement calculations. First off, I never included social security ever. So it's as if I always assumed that I would never have social security. If I ever do get social security, and I'm not convinced I'm going to get social security, that's just going to be gravy. So if you take social security out of the equation, then that that conundrum kind of disappears. Um, you just It's gravy if you get it. And if you don't get it, well, it doesn't matter because you planned for it. Ben, do you use Social Security in your in your retirement projections when you're helping somebody oh, yeah, put a definitely. plan together? Definitely. I mean, it, it's it's as it stands now, it's not possible to for Social Security to run out. It's a dedicated payroll tax. Now, not, dollar for dollar is not accounted for, which is a problem. But like seventy cents on the dollars accounted for. So even if you know the the twenty thirty four or whatever it is these days 
you're still going to get 70 cents on whatever the dollar is. It's a dedicated payroll tax. Every two weeks that we work, we pay into the payroll system. That goes out to current retirees. So the idea of not getting anything, I don't think, um, unless there's means testing or something in the future, you know, people that are close to retirement today will get some Social Security. So I, I, don't, I don't want that to influence anybody's claiming decision. I got to get claim early because it's running out. I don't think that holds water for me. But I do like the idea. I do like the idea of what Len did, which is if you can do it without it, if it works without it, that's fantastic. Absolutely. Yeah, it's hyper conservative. Yeah. So it's so you're you're under promising over delivering. And that's great. Well, what about some of the things in, in retirement, like the big expenses that come up? Do you feel like people plan for that enough? Like, you know, I buy a car every so many years, as an example, would be a big expense or. I want to do some of these massive, uh, massive trips that I haven't taken during my Ideally, life. You want to have a sinking fund where if you're going to spend $30,000, you want to take out $1,000 a month, 30 months in advance, especially if it's coming out of an IRA. So you can spread it over multiple years. That, that seems to help with the tax bill. Uh, but ultimately, I, I've found that the same uh, skill set that people have to save money is not the same skill set they need to spend it. A lot of people need me to lean on them to actually spend the money that they've saved. So that the, the mechanics is a little easier than the actual, uh, the energy of like, hey, you need to spend some of this money. It's still accumulating, you've been retired, you need to go take that trip, you need to go make that financial gift, whatever it is. So a sinking fund is probably the best physical way to do it, I think. And you just segregate that. You'd have it be a separate fund altogether, I would imagine, behaviorally. Yeah, yeah, you, you pay it out of your 401k and then, and then you squirrel it away in a high yield savings account or money market. There's a few that I pieces of this piece that I don't like. There's a few things I don't like. Uh, uh, one, Paula, let's start with you. We're going to go once around here with with these things. But 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 uh, retire at 62 if you want to learn new things. That just rubbed me the wrong way. The yeah. idea of retire early if you want to learn something new. I, I don't like that either. I, if you are interested in learning something new, let's say you want to learn chess, right? You can have a job and learn chess. You can have a job and learn how to build model airplanes or learn needlepoint or learn how to paint, right? There, if you're not doing it when you have a job, then you're not going to do it when you don't have a job, right? If you're not doing it, then you're not doing it. Yeah, I, yeah, I feel like that, that do it now. Like, don't wait yeah. for 62. Yeah, exactly. Len, uh, uh, re reason number two on here, retire at 62 if you know what else you want to do. You know, there's these, there, there are people listening to this who are 32 years old, 33 years old, and they feel like they're not doing the thing that they want to do. What would you tell those people? I would tell you to stop doing it. I mean, you're wasting your life doing something you don't want to do. Get out as soon as you can and and do what you want to do because life is too short. First off, I, I think a lot of people that don't do that they don't want to do, they're not going to be. You're not going to be good at what you're going to do what you're doing anyways. So I think you're just compromising, and it's important to to go and do what you want to do. And the sooner you recognize that, the better off you'll be. Do you believe though, Len, that there is a messy middle to life? Like, you know, there's the shine on the new job. Everything's great. But then you realize that you start at the bottom. Like, I remember we had this guy who worked with me at American Express who thought that he was going to get the great accounts. And he was pissed that he was working with, like, the people that were barely doing anything with American Express. <laughs> they had no relationship with the company. And I remember one of my managers looking at this guy going, you thought we were going to give the – you really thought we were going to give the new guy – like the high end relationships, the ones that we really count on, the unproven person. Like, th I think for some of us, th there can be these unrealistic expectations in this, uh, this, I don't know. Do you believe in the messy middle? Yeah, well, I, I do. I, I think you have, I mean, you have to do the grunt work in any profession. I mean, whether, you know, the restaurant industry, obviously got to start, you know, most people should start uh, bus and tables and doing the dishes uh, before they get to being a waiter or a chef or what have you. And it's, it's the same, I think, in most other professions. You've got to do that dirty work. That's how you learn most of your, that's where you get most of your experience, actually, is not doing the dirty work and doing things you don't necessarily uh, expect you might want not want to do when you first start. You might want the glamour stuff uh, early, but there's no, here, here's the other reason why you want to do that. It builds, it builds respect among your peers. So, 
uh, if you just start off at the top and getting those top uh, contracts and, and right off the bat, you, you don't have the respect. You don't earn the respect of your peers. So it, it's important just, if anything, to re re earn that respect from your peers um, it, it, rather than just getting off and, and, and thinking everything's going to be great right from day one. Because in most businesses, it, it's not going to be that way. The last one, Ben, that kind of bothers me is right up at the top, number one, and I know that you said you guys are talking about health a lot lately on the show. And reason number one to retire early is if you want to stay healthier longer. And I think it kind of almost goes to what what somebody was saying earlier about, you know, you can, Paul, I think you said it, about this idea that I'm going to race now for this beautiful future. Should I be thinking about my health when I'm 62 or should maybe I try to find a way to integrate it today? I guess better late than ever. Yeah. You probably don't have to retire fully from, you know, your job to, to practice some good habits. I mean, how long does it take to walk around the block, right? How long does it take to, I don't know, do a lap around the office? Like if it's in your head that you should start focusing on your health, you should do that right now. At whatever age you hear this, you should do that right now. So that in and of itself, a reason to retire is maybe a stretch. I don't know. I just think you can look at some things. Like when I, when I think about health, I think about sleep quality, you can have a demanding job and have better sleep quality by doing a few things. You can you can um, do the walking like you're talking about. Like there's there there are plenty of intentional things you can do. You can eat yeah, different foods. Tracking macros takes five minutes. You know, it's it, there, there's a lot of easy things, a lot of low hanging fruit, uh, pun intended. Yeah, <laughs> nice job. I wouldn't. Is it a le is it size of a lemon? <laughs> Slightly larger than a lemon. Fruit the size of a lemon. Yeah, I think that's a that's a great place to place to leave it. Uh, uh, I will link to this piece on our show notes at stackybenjamins.com. And I hope people got a lot out of it today and also got maybe a good idea of a few things. Number one, it's not about tomorrow, but also number two, the big difference between uh, retirement and financial independence. And then number three is, uh, well, heck, Doug, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wait for you to maybe fill in uh, three of these here in a second. But let's, let's find out what's going on where each of you guys are. Let's start with our guest of honor, Ben. What's happened on the podcast, my friend? Well, I'm going to do, uh, like I said at the beginning of the show, I'm uh, trying to be a retirement crash test dummy, making investments in my health. So I did a full body MRI that I'm going to uh, show everyone the results and tell you if I think it's a, a good idea to invest in, uh, in a full body MRI as you approach retirement, as you're investing in your health. So watch for that in the coming months. Is that expensive? It's expensive and health insurance uh, laughs at you when you, when you, uh, ask them to cover something. It's 2,500 bucks. It's very expensive. I saw a guy do a similar thing. He went to the Cleveland clinic for a day. And I think he said that was $3,000 and they put him through a whole yeah. range of stuff. But if you've got 30 years of your life ahead of you, it's a great time to make those investments and say, if I can get, you know, if I can learn what's going on inside my body and if I can extend my good years of retirement a few years, that can be worth an awful lot of money. So I think it's good to make those investments yeah. in cer certain circumstances. Yeah. I heard the number. I thought that's crazy. And then I saw the results. And he talked about the results and how glowingly he talked about the results and how much of a difference it's going to make in his life uh, could be huge. But you got to do something. Yeah. In the grand scheme of things, you know, the average Social Security check is like $2,500. So if this literally extends your life a month, it pays for itself. And that's it. Retirement Starts Today Radio, wherever finer podcasts are located. That's right. Thank you. Len, what's going on at LenPenzo.com, man, besides the squirrel cam? You know what I want? I want the squirrel cam like on the front page where it's 24-7. Like, I think that would be, uh, that'd be a huge, huge addition. I'll, uh, you know what? Uh, that's a good, I'll, I'll see about that. I may do that. It, uh, it's going all the time. I've, I've got tons of videos every day. So, uh, it might get a little boring, but, uh, we've, I put up some, uh, uh, chicken wire around there. We got a new puppy. So I had to put chicken wire around it to keep the, the puppy from the eating the squirrels nuts. And, uh, <laughs> And now there's cage matches. You'll get two squirrels in there, and uh, it's quite a you'll you'll get quite a, a quite a, a a cage match experience in there every once in a while. So you could sell tickets to that. I could. I, I actually could. It's it's actually quite entertaining. Yeah, it's quite entertaining. I was telling somebody earlier, by the way, how disturbed I was when I found the squirrel cam video so compelling. Like, I watched it longer than I really wanted to, and I thought, what the hell am I doing? <laughs> like, what is, what is going on? Well, I've got the the after dark ones are 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 really good. I've got a couple. Uh, there's there, you'll have to see. There's there's more video. There's there's animals that you wouldn't even imagine that show up on there. I'll uh, I'll, I'll spread. I'll share some of those too. Besides the rats and the and the possums. 
<laughs> Do it soon before Len in, institutes the paywall. Yes. What's coming up at LenPenzo.com? I don't know. It, it, squirrel Cam. Come over Squirrel Cam. There'll be something over there for everyone. Paula, what is going on at the Afford Anything podcast? So we on the Afford Anything podcast are talking to a couple of guys who are experts at NFTs, non-fungible tokens, and they're going to explain exactly what is an NFT, uh, why does it matter, and is this something that you should be paying attention to in your financial life. So they'll, they, re, they do a fantastic job of really breaking it down. We also previously spoke Wait a minute, with hold George... on, Paula. Mm -hmm. are, are they going to talk about what the hell happened in the NFT market? <laughs> yes, yeah, we, we go through the, the, the storied history of NFTs. Because um, I think yes. a lot of people don't know about all the, I mean, that was a circus for a while. It was, it was, I mean, it was literally circus in that one of the most popular NFTs was an image of a monkey, right? It was yeah. uh, that image. Yeah, exactly. Joe, you say it was for a while, like it's all settled down now and now it's just <laughs> safe as houses. Well, it is settled down in the way that a lot of the overinflated market has corrected. And also we, we saw places get raided. We saw people going to jail. We saw we saw all kinds of craziness in the Wild West of NFTs. So anyway, that, that, that should be super interesting, Paul. Can't imagine. Yeah. So to learn all about NFTs and Web3 and, and the world of crypto, uh, tune in to the Afford Anything podcast. We're, again, we're finer podcast. Everywhere. Yes. Are Spotify, fine. Apple Podcasts. We're on YouTube now. It, but, but maybe all you can help out WeWork and, and see if they can, you can <laughs> maybe donate a... <laughs> she said to hold maybe. the microphone stand the entire time, people. <laughs> Maybe WeWork could issue an NFT. Maybe to support their purchase of a microphone stand for Paula. Nice job. All right. Uh, that's going to do it for us. Almost. Guess what we're going to bring back, guys? Let's, uh, why don't we see what's going on on the back porch, guys? I actually told this story earlier on a podcast because we, we, were, we were talking about um, forgetting people's names. And... Um, and he told this, he'd been going to the same barber for forever. The guy whose show was on and the barber, he brings his kid. Cause he's so proud. He's gone to the same barber. Dude's like 85. His name is Josh. And he walks in. He's like, you brought your son, John. <laughs> he's mm -hmm. like, I've known you forever. And you think my name is John. <laughs> I had this, I had this doctor. I had this doctor who I absolutely loved. Doug, he was in Southfield. He was an amazing doctor, Dr. Schwartz. And uh, went to him forever. And finally, I recommended that my wife go see him. And, and, and he and Cheryl hit it off. And, uh, and so she starts seeing him uh, uh, also. And then I come in for a checkup one time. And he looks at my file. I've been going to the dude for like six years. Cheryl has been, got, has been there for like six months. And he looks at my file. He goes, Joe, so I'll see you. Are you related to Cheryl? I'm like, I'm the one that introduced you to <laughs> Cheryl. <laughs> I'm the dude that bragged about it. you've no idea who I am. Like I tell him that. And, and of course he starts laughing. Well, anyway, we get to that part of the physical where I am pretty naked and I'm bending over the desk, right. To get ready for that thing. And he's putting on the latex glove and he starts laughing. <laughs> and I'm like, there's nothing worse when I'm bent over a thing with my pants around my ankles and the dude's putting on a glove laughing. I'm like, Oh my God, uh, do I want to know? And he's like, yeah, I was just thinking, I can't remember your name, but you're not about to forget mine. <laughs> he said that. And I was like, oh, I'm sitting there cracking up while I'm bending over the. <laughs> That's funny. Just <laughs> awkward as <laughs> ever. Like <And> this conversation. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> So there I was, my feet up in the stirrups. Doug, you at the wrong doctor. Doug, quick save us. What are our takeaways from today's show? <laughs> so what's stacked up on our to-do list today? First, take some advice from Benjamin Brandt. Getting ready to retire? Recognize your skill set and start working on your gaps. Already a great saver? Well, you might need to learn how to spend a little in retirement. 
Second, take it from Paula, you don't have to wait for retirement to learn something new. If you're not motivated enough to dive into something new while you have a job, you probably won't when you're retired, so just do it now. But what's the biggest to do? If I'm gonna retire early, apparently, I'm gonna have to put away this box of Twinkies. Now, oh, who am I kidding? I'm gonna be working forever. Can't put these Twinkies away. Thanks to Benjamin Brandt for joining us today. Head over to retirementstartstoday.com to learn more about the great things they're doing. We'll also include links in our show notes at stackingbenjamins.com. Thanks to Paula Pant for hanging out with us today. You'll find her fabulous podcast, Afford Anything, wherever you listen to finer podcasts. And thanks to Len Penzo for joining us today. You can find Len Penzo at lenpenzo.com slash ratfights. This show is the property of SB Podcasts, LLC, copyright 2024, and is created by Joe Saul Cihai. Our producer is Karen Repine. Karen and Joe get help from a few of our neighborhood friends. You'll find out about our awesome team at stackingbenjamins.com, along with the show notes and how you can find us on YouTube and all the usual social media spots. Come say hello. Oh, yeah, and before I go, not only should you not take advice from these nerds, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only. Before making any financial decisions, speak with a real financial advisor. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and we'll see you next time back here at the Stacking Benjamin Show. <laughs>